They say that every weekend around two million people go to car boot sales. They also say that car boot sales aren't what they used to be. These days, they're full of traders, not people who cleared out the cupboard under their stairs like they're supposed to be. Well, for old time's sake, the Scrimpers team cleared out their cupboards under the stairs and went to meet some of the two million. A bit overwhelming, Harry. What? It's a bit overwhelming. It is a bit overwhelming. Ah. Well, let's get it. Let's get it on the What's table anyway. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Try and find it. <laughs> so, what are we trying to do here exactly? Lay things out attractively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can uh, no, very Apparently, one of the principles is don't put all the good stuff out at first. But quite frankly, I don't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> 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 Of course, we haven't priced anything, have we? Well, what we do should we really do that. We'll put a price on it now. We should at least decide what we're going to sell it for. When we start haggling with people, how far? I mean, if we set a price for it, right? And then when we start haggling with people, I mean, do we say, no, it has to go for that? Do we start getting aggressive? Not aggressive, but, you know, sort of more... Not aggressive, I don't think that helps. Oh. It probably does when you're buying, <laughs> but not when you're selling. But we should be prepared to come down a bit, so when we decide our prices, we should raise them by maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 percent, be prepared to come down. Two horn. Oh, it's a value by antique, that, right? That's not true. I'm looking forward to this. We should have done some quiet homework first. We should have done some quiet homework like Lawrence Smith does. Lawrence makes things which, at first sight, gave a terrific jolt to my memory. He calls them proggy mats. We used to call them rag rugs. Well, I don't know if, if anybody else who makes them um, the same way that Lawrence makes them. I mean, there'd be an odd farmer's wife, maybe make a one for a kitchen floor. But, um, and he's always done them. He's always had a one on the go, even for the winter nights. Because he wasn't the one for going out for drinking or anything. And he would say, all right, we'll just have a, a, a mat stitched in. Will you stitch the hessian for us? I said, right. And then he would just start and cut up all the things that we could find. He seamed them all and took all the linings and things out. So he does all the work, I don't do anything with the mats. I've never bought a, a carpet rug for, from a fireplace. We've always had the ones he's made. And the one through the other end it was to match a carpet which we had. It wasn't worn out when I got the new carpet so I wasn't going to throw the mat away. The one in the kitchen could be, well, about 30 years old, which would start off in the living room and it's ended up now in the scullery. Jean stretches hessian on a homemade frame. Then Lawrence gets to work with small strips of old woolen fabric. Working on the underside of the mat, he doubles the strip lengthwise and pushes one end through a hole in the hessian. Then the other end through the hole next door. It's simple, but it goes on and on. It's kept Lawrence busy and he had a stroke two years ago and it's, it's got his hand back working again and, and uh, he does quite well, I think, for the age he is. It keeps him going. The greatest use for fabric scraps is patchwork. And what can be scrimpier than this? something beautiful made out of scraps. Patchwork is a theme that runs through the whole world of thrift, making something useful out of what you can salvage. Same as re-knitting unraveled woolies, making new collars from shirt tails, or cooking bubble and squeak. I can tell you that you this is our sundress. <laughs> yes, that's an old sundress. We're running short of thread now. That's an old shirt in the sums. That was pyjamas. During the war, if you like, we had to make doing many parachutes. We were taken to pieces. The Starbridge ladies told us about the quilts they'd made from scraps of old dresses and their husbands' pyjamas. But mainly, they talked to each other in this least lonely of crafts. But should you stick a price on everything, I mean, like, like these, how would you know what to charge for those skates? Well, what you really should do is know how much a new one costs. Mm -hmm. I must admit, I don't. 
So what, what, what do you reckon? The thing is, if you're pricing, I mean, you either price to go, mm. you want to get rid of it, so you price it low, or you're pricing to make money, in which case you're going to put it, say, I don't know, 30% above what you really want to accept for it to give the it's buyer a, a chance to haggle and cut yeah. it down and feel better yeah. about the whole deal. So you're going to stick the price on everything, in theory? In you've theory, got time. Yeah. in practice, I don't think we're going to have time. Mm. That's why it's best to prepare beforehand, you know, sort everything out, like anything else. Mm. But here we go. She's in our booth. What are you doing in there? <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Dear me. She knows what she's doing. That's very oh, proud of that. It's a nice little pot. Yeah, it's nice. Hey. She's creeping about. I'm you, not. I'm what just do having you want? a look. It's nice. You're going to buy it or what? Yeah, I might do. Yeah, where's she gone, your mum? You. Oh, that's nice, Rick. No, what do you think? that will be for me. Oh, I see. Well, how much are you going to pay for it? I'll give you a pound. No, 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 no. <laughs> Odd pound. I think that seems like a fair offer. A pound? Be taken. We don't want to take this home, Ray. It's made in Portugal. It's excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're a long way from the remote farm in the state of Georgia where Irma Musto grew up. But the lessons she learned there are happily still with her. Okay. What goes on in this room? This is actually where I flop to do my oh. next day's planning. No. So, um, over what? here I've got all of my books what? where I put everything in. Yeah. What, all the meals? Yeah, everything that we've had. Planned every day of the year? Every day of the year. But why do you write it all down? So that I can refer back to it, so that I don't repeat. And not just this year, oh. every meal for ten years. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually I should flop here. Ah. Um, okay, this is our current one. Okay. We've got here an inventory of everything in the house. Oh, okay. um, for instance, this is a list of the sunroom. Now, this is when we were, were decorating, and the dates that, that we did it. And we've got the paint, the carpet. Why have you actually put down what everything cost? Oh, because it helps me keep track of my budget. Um, it helps me the next time I want to paint the room or something. I will come back to this. I know what colour I painted it, uh, what paint I used, whether it lasted well or not, and how much I should expect to pay this time. What's that, a cat litter tray? Yes, yes. It's done with newspapers. I actually always use the Guardian for the cat litter, for the shredded bit. It's more absorbent. Uh, there are thousands of things you can do with newspapers. Uh, I use them, for instance, for thawing out the fridge, you know, the freezer. Mm. Put them all in the bottom, scrape all the ice in, throw out the lot. Use them for lining drawers, cabinets, um, chest of drawers. Pack them up, put them in shoes that are too tight, mm. stretch them a little bit. You can even make inner cells out of them. You can roll them up and play Are You There Moriarty. <laughs> thousands of uses for it. Uh, and here we've got uh, all the bits pieces of soap that I save. Um, as the little bars of soap come down, you save the little pieces, they get them nice and dry, so you have to actually leave yeah. them here for a while. Which I'll show you how I do it. Yeah, okay. go on then, Irma. Right. Okay, now over here, this is actually the way it looks, you see. Uh, this one was done in uh, a little blister pack. This one's ready to come out now. Yeah. Uh, just a little blister pack. Trim off the funny edges. Um, now, if you take your bar of soap and just chip up into here, this is why you want it nice and dry, so that you get these very fine little pieces into the bar of soap. Yeah. Okay, so you fill your little mould. This, in fact, comes from um, a bar of vanish soap. Yeah. Okay, bring it over to the tap, fill it up with water. Do you want me to fill it up with water now? Yeah. Okay. So just going to fill that up. And, of course, all of this soap that's dried out now, it's going to reabsorb this. Yeah. Just get that. Like that. Put so it here. Yeah. A day or so. Keep coming back, smooth it yeah. down. And that will be a nice little marble bar I want to soap. ask you a question. Okay. Why do you do it? Because it's fun. Oh. Here we are. Well, there are beekeepers and there are keepers of bees. And being a good scrimper, I'm a keeper of bees. And uh, there they all are, working on my behalf, making me honey and wax. And I don't put very much effort into it. I let them get on with it. Probably don't see them from October to March. And how much honey do you get? I get about 60 pounds um, a year out of this hive, and uh, a good beekeeper would probably get, oh, I don't know, 100 pounds, but uh, he'd have to put a lot more effort into it. Well, I'm with you. <laughs> all that honey, and of course, all that wax. Uh, this is the melted beeswax that oh. we've got from John's beehives, okay? Mm -hmm. And now we're going to pour in the turpentine, mix that. 
You want four ounces of melted beeswax and 12 ounces of pure turpentine. That will sit there two or three days. Um, this is some that I've just done recently. Yeah. You can smell it. Thank you. Nice, firm. Oh, it's lovely, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it gorgeous? Nice. Absolutely super for mm. furniture. This is. Now I'll show you a sewing room. Now in here I've got all of our buttons. I save buttons, of course. Yes. Throw something away, keep the buttons. Um, the rest of it's probably become a dust cloth. <laughs> there are all of the ribbons, things like that. So you make all your own clothes? Oh yes, I make all of my clothes, all of my husband's clothes, uh, all the children's clothes, virtually every stitch we wear. Really? Hmm, doesn't everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. This is when the wax comes in. I melt down all the bits of old comb and stuff like that, and then I strain it through Irma's stockings to get out the bee's legs and wings and nasty bits, and probably put it into a margarine tub, and then I get a block like this. Copper pipe's the thing for candles. Almost blocked at one end, but with a hole for the wick. And matchsticks at each end to hold it in position. The wick you can buy from a craft shop. Stand it in sand. In goes the wax. And afterwards, the candle comes out of the tube that much easier if you put the whole thing in the freezer first. And there's our beeswax candle. Put it in. And if you don't have beeswax, you could do this with any old candle ends and you certainly drippings. can. These candles down here are all made with old candle ends. And then we light the candle. Do you think you're getting any better at this? Well, the people are nice. I'm not sure that they're not trying to con me. I mean, they're yeah. all smiling, you know, I mean, then they, uh, they, look, they look as if they know more than I do. They're probably <laughs> sure. <laughs> Don't <laughs> be rude. I'm trying hard. Yeah, there's some people around here that look very experienced. Still? Yeah, still. There's right. some fine scrimpers out here as well. Well, I haven't sold any clothes, have you? One. One? Yeah. But why is it? I mean, why? why well, if you look that? around, you see the people who are really doing well on the clothes. They've got them better displayed than we have. They've got proper rails, everything's sort of sorted, washed, ironed, well, this priced. Is stuff, isn't it? Oh, priced. Yeah, but it looks, yeah. it looks, to, it looks to a kid. It looks now. like a pile of uh, it? jumble. Yeah. I've had enough of this stallholder lark. I'm going back to being a customer like Sue Keep. I'm totally addicted. I cannot pass a second hand shop without going in and having a look. I have earrings, I have shoes. In fact, I have more shoes than the Melda Marcos. But it hasn't cost me anything hardly at all. In fact, I can just indulge myself. It's my little luxury and it's fun. I enjoy it. The total here, yeah. except for the wedding dress, cost me less than 30 pound. 10p, two pound. 20p, £5.20, 40p, £2.50, 30 pence, £3, 30p. Meanwhile, down in the scrapyards, the men are getting their hands dirty. It's amazing. Some of this stuff, you think you'll never sell it in a million years, but there's always somebody who'll come along and buy it. Ah, this is something I'm looking for. The old bedstead iron. It's uh, damn good stuff as well. It, um, I suppose it needs to be if the old chap's going to start jumping off the wardrobe, but um, this particular stuff ain't a lot of good to us. It's got too many rivets in it. By the time you've got rid of them, you've got so many holes, it's like a pikelet or something. Don't seem to see the old Vono stuff now. It seems to have gone out of vogue a little bit. I suppose lots of folks like me have used it for different things. Well, the agricultural corner. A scrapyard in the Midlands is a Tutankhamun's tomb of industrial archaeology. No blade. Oh, I don't know. There we go. Oh, it's had a bit of use as well. Interesting, these. They're made locally. Bell Broughton. There was a whole water powered industry that operated there. Ah, oh, smashing. Here you go. That's the stuff. Clean as a whistle, not a hole in sight. Yeah, that's it. Beautiful even even got the badge on it as well. That's right, so ah, the uh, Vono badge. All six yeah. or two inches of it. Well, this is the, the Vono bedstead iron. 
that um, that you've seen us uh, buying at Arthur's. You oh, know. you got this oh, exactly. Right. So, and the whole railway is made of it, apart from the actual running rails themselves. the legs and these girders. It's so light and strong, you see, so it's ideal for this job. Hold on, it's going through. And what made you think it would be suitable? Well, it's very strong and resilient, you know. Um, it's re-rolled, in fact, when it was re-rolled first. It was from railway lines, from old really? railway lines, which were worn down. And it was rolled into bedstead iron, and I think it's quite ironical now we're using it for railway again, you know. Dave Perks's workshop is mostly equipped with the discarded tools of a collapsed manufacturing industry. This drill over here must be what, 1940? 1940, something like that, wartime, American. What state was it in when you found it? It was, it, it was sort of rough looking, sort of gaubed with paint and full of sawdust. Um, but basically very sound, I think, apart from cleaning it out and cleaning it up. Um, and putting fresh knobs on the handles. I think that's all we've done to it and just used it straight away. It's not another Arthur's job, is it? It's from Arthur's Yard about 22 years ago now. That was the first machine tool I bought. That's great. <laughs> that, yeah. Do you ever buy new tools? Odd ones, but not, not big stuff. Uh, because I think, frankly, in a lot of cases, it isn't up to the old stuff that you'll find knocking about. It's true, that, isn't it? I mean, it's not just nostalgia, it's fact. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they've got no sort of notion of the things they ever wearing out. They just built them to last forever, and I suppose in some respects that was their downfall. All our millet economies go to feed our animals. Other people scrimp and scrape with a birthday or a holiday or a wedding or even a funeral in mind. But Anne and her husband Bob think of the horses. The animals eat far better than we do. We spend very little on ourselves. Anne and Bob know every scrimping trick in the book, so we set them a task. Do us a scrimp as Christmas, we said. Use the countryside, use whatever's around to decorate the house, even though it's still August. Give us something out of Dickens. Hello. Hello, Ray. This looks smashing. Thanks. Evergreens are the traditional way of decorating a home. And not just holly either, but ivy too and all sorts of conifers. Sprigs of elderflower have to be dried for Christmas. And there is a point here. Be careful with candles. Don't let the kids light them. Keep them in jars. Don't go away and leave them. Anyway, they look too good for that. Anne makes things big. She makes frameworks of wire coat hangers and decks them out with papier-mâché and tissue paper. She's mad on gold paint. These are painted stars of one kind or another. That's um, pan scrub. Bits off it, I just pull bits off it. Um, most of these things I get from car boot sales and I pick things up and just pull it to pieces and then make various items from it. The roses are tissue paper as well. And then on the Christmas tree, we have these little toilet paper roses again. And they, they're very, very easy to make. Anne starts off with a little ball of toilet paper wired tightly to form the center. The rose is gradually built up, first using small petals of paper, then larger petals and so on, all the time wiring them together. All this reminds me of something that used to be called handwork at school, and of making paper chains and dipping pine cones in silver paint. Roses do look prettier though. All you need is a bit of dexterity, patience and practice. and green paper to finish them off with. What you get at the end, once you've plumped it out and trimmed it, is a sort of old English cabbage rose. This one took Anne eight minutes to make. There's no doubt that pretty decorations and naked flames are a potentially lethal combination. So keep an extinguisher and a bucket of water in the room. We very rarely have them on for very long. It just gives a nice effect for about five minutes, but after that, 
you've got to be very careful because the jars and everything heat up so you sort of have to keep a, an eye on everything and keep an eye on the tree as well as the um, tapers they go down pretty quickly um, these ribbons are rather nice we made those out of toilet paper as well I'm going to make a nice soft blue paper garland if I can if I can beat this blue rail to the other end of the kitchen and then I'm going to break it off and hold it for a minute while it tightens on itself when it starts jumping up and down it's nearly ready and then feel by the action of the rope it's tightening up now so I let go and I whistle and come back and switch on cut it as so turn it twist it into a lover's knot trim the bottoms off a wee bit make it look nice and tidy and there, that's what we have What's this tree on it? Well, that's a holly tree. Basically, it's for people who don't have Christmas trees or don't like Christmas trees. And what I've done, I've, I've just got a piece of holly, cut it off, cut it down a bit, and I've got little ribbons all over it, and I've also put a big white ribbon at the top. I've put a few corn dolly angels, which I make anyway, and a few corn dollies, because I li like the tradition of corn dollies on, on trees. And are these uh, the presents, are they? Yeah, they're the presents. That, uh, they're basically gypsy pegs. And I cut them from the willow tree and I paint them. I get my willow where I can find it. And it's a very useful tree because it's very easy to cut. And you can just see how you can make three peg lengths from it. And then I let it dry for a while first. Anne starts with a real gypsy peg. And firstly, I mark it as per the old gypsy peg. And I use a part of an aluminium can cut down on the end of the gypsy peg. And I put it round the top and I tighten it up. And then I get a tin tack. This is where life gets difficult. And now I get the hammer if I can get it to stay there. And I hammer it in as quickly as I can. Cleave it down. So this is what gypsies used to do at home. With Christmas on the way, Anne's producing 40 painted pegs a day. They really seem too good to put on a clothesline. And then make nice presents. If you can't afford a lot, you like to make your own. So I make all those and put them in the little jute sacks, which I cut down from a peanut sack, which I got from the greengrocers for 50p. <laughs> and it makes a, an awful lot of sacks. So it's quite good, really. Well, they're lovely. Can I have one? Yes, help yourself. You. Scrimper's first rule, if you don't ask, you don't get. Happy Christmas, when it comes. Thrifty 50, 50 ideas to help you scrimp. For a copy, send a postal order or cheque for £2 made out to Channel 4 to Scrimpers, PO Box 4000, London W3, 6XJ. Waste want none, that's what they will say. Waste not, want none, don't throw.